Questions 5 and 11 have been withdrawn, and I call Andrew Muir. Number one, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I want to thank the member um, for the question. I am aware of the problem of the erection of illegal flags and emblems on street furniture. It is a persistent problem and needs dealt with in a comprehensive manner. The flying of flags and the attachment of emblems onto departmental street lighting columns is an offence under the Roads Order 1993, and my department has the power to remove them from its property. One of my department's primary considerations is the safety of the public, and where unauthorised flags or attachments pose a hazard to road users, my department will always seek to remove that danger. While recognising my department's responsibility, the reality is that if we as a society are to find a sustainable and lasting solution to the problem of illegal flags and emblems, then we must all step up as ministers, uh, as a united executive, as leaders and members of all parties in this assembly, with councils, landowners, agencies, including the housing executive and the PSNI, and importantly, with and in support of communities. I understand this is an area being explored with a view to finding consensus by the Commission on Flags, Identity, Culture and Tradition, set up as part of the Fresh Start Agreement, with the report due to the First and Deputy First Minister. I also note the commitments to accommodating and respecting identities and cultures in the New Decade New Approach Agreement. It is long past time that we got to grips with this issue and the issues that lie beneath it. I can assure the member that I am committed to working with executive colleagues and with everyone required so that we can deal with this issue in a comprehensive and lasting way. I call Andrew Muir for supplementary. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And first, I want to start by welcoming the Minister to her role as a fellow parkrunner. I know that she will succeed. Um, I thank her for her response. Um, does the Minister agree that the erection of flags and emblems can be used to mark our territory? And that, um, what is the status of the current flags protocol that is already in place, and how is that being implemented? Um, yes, I, I do agree that flags can be used to mark our territory. And uh, as I said in my response, it is a problem that persists and that we need to comprehensively try to uh, deal with. Uh, in terms of taking this issue forward, I do believe that part of the answer does lie in the Commission. Uh, and I believe that we really need to find a political consensus and show leadership at all levels in trying to achieve that. I am committed to doing that. I'm committed to doing that within my department. But I am realistic. I understand the nature of this problem. And so I also understand that if we are to genuinely deal with it, then we must all work together. I call Mervyn Storey. Speaker, and I welcome the Minister to her post and wish her well. Uh, unfortunately, for many years in my constituency in the village of Risharkin, there has been illegal signs put up on top of directional signs. Uh, this is intimidating. It's been put up uh, in support of Republican uh, prisoners and repeatedly both the, the police and your department have failed to address this issue. When are you going to allow the Protestant minority in the village of Risharkin to live free from the intimidation of these types of activity? I, I thank the member for his question. I firmly believe that everyone should live free from intimidation. I don't see this as an issue of one side or the other. I accept that my department ha has a role to play. It's clear that under Article 87 uh, of the Roads Order, it is an offence to fix certain attachments to the surface of a road, tree structure, or other works in or on a road. And it is this legislation that my department would seek to rely on. Um, I want to work with the PSNI, I want to work with communities, I actually want to work with every single member in this House because that is the only way that we are going to genuinely tackle this issue in a sustainable and lasting way. I call Karen McCullen. Uh, last can call you and I too welcome the Minister to your first question, Tim, wish her well. Um, the Department has been working on revised guidelines or guidance to staff around this for some time. And the question I want to ask is, will the Minister ensure that illegally erected flags, that there's robust measures taken through legislation? And I'm sure she'll agree with me that everyone, regardless who they are, where they live, has to live free from sectarian harassment. I absolutely uh, agree with the member. Um, I have asked for a detailed submission on guidelines and, and as I've said consistently in answering the questions, 
we do need to robustly deal with this, but we need to do it in a way that actually tackles the underlying issues as well. It is not just a simple issue of erecting an illegal flag or a banner um, on a lamppost uh, or on a, uh, a bit of street furniture. We need to get to grips with the underlying issues. We all need to show leadership. Uh, and that means that we should be as vociferously opposed to uh, illegal paramilitary flags represent loyalist paramilitaries going up as we should be uh, for issues to do with dissident republicans. We need to be uh, approach this in a very equal way and so I want to work with everyone in this house and I do want to play my part uh, in tackling this issue. I call Jim Allister. Uh, could I agree with Mr Storey's comments to the Minister? I trust she will take them on board. But could I ask her, in respect of her department, not only have the issue of flags, but we have the issue of permanent structures on departmental lands and the lands of armed length bodies, glorifying in forms of memorials, terrorism. What action has been taken in that regard? A predecessor of hers told me there were 34 such memorials in place. Has any action been taken? And does she agree that until we get to zero tolerance of the physical force tradition, then we are going round in circles? On this matter. Uh, uh, thank the member um, for his question. Uh, uh, if he has uh, details of any structures that are on DFI land, I'm uh, happy to look at it. Yes, we should have a zero to tolerance approach, but we should also uh, approach this issue with a uh, universally zero tolerant approach. So we should not accept uh, signs or structures in some places and not others. And I look forward to working with the member and with others as we, uh, we take that universal zero tolerance approach. Moving on, I call John Dallet. Question at all. Question number two. Um, I want to thank the member for his question. Investment in infrastructure is not an end in itself. It is a bedrock on which we deliver our programme for government outcomes. That is why, over the next two years, my focus will be on developing a sustainable water, drainage and transport infrastructure that improves people's lives unlocks economic potential and plays our part in tackling the climate emergency, the single greatest global challenge we all face. I clearly recognise the important contribution that community transport makes towards delivering that ambition and connecting some of our most vulnerable people and rural communities. However, severe constraints in my department's budgets over recent years has resulted in reduced funding across a range of areas including community transport and the public transport network with TransLink. This has created significant challenges and is not sustainable if we collectively are to deliver on our programme for government ambitions to connect all our people and communities to the opportunities which many of us can take for granted. I am committed to finding solutions to protect and maintain rural and community transport services However, we all need to recognise that the benefits of community transport go well beyond my department, impacting across the full range of programme for government outcomes. The fact that health-related trips currently account for one quarter of all community transport journeys is a perfect illustration of these wider impacts. At a time of constrained budgets, delivering my ambitions for community transport will require innovation, greater collaboration and cross-departmental working. I hope that executive colleagues and all parties in this place will support my efforts to ensure the most vulnerable across our communities and our rural areas can continue to benefit from this essential service. I call John Dallet for supplementary. Mr Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for a very comprehensive answer. And I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge the support and help that her department gave during the suspension of the Assembly. I welcome the fact that the Minister has given uh, an undertaking to work in partnership with the other departments, and I would ask her uh, to ensure that that in fact happens and that community transport continues to serve the people in the way that it did in the past. I completely uh, agree with the member. Um, and he makes a very important point. The fact is that if we are to achieve our ambitions of delivering sustainable community, then we all need to work together. As I said, community transport isn't just an issue for my department. It's an issue for many of health and well-being. 
and an important means to prevent social isolation. It is a lifeline service that enables some of the most vulnerable groups and communities in society to access basic opportunities. The fact that health-related trips currently account for one quarter of all community transport journeys illustrates this, I think, in a very clear way. I am keen to work with executive colleagues to deliver collaborative programmes such as the Assisted Rural Travel Scheme, which I work alongside the Minister for DERA on, because we need to ensure that we continue to support our vulnerable members right across our society so that they can access the opportunities that many of us take for granted. I call Linda Dillon. I wish the Minister well in her first question time, and I thank her for her answers thus far. And I'm, I'm happy to hear the acknowledgement around the social, social, social isolation. I represent Mid Ulster, which is a very rural constituency and stretches the whole way from Swatra to Five Mile Town. So it's a massive area, and a lot of people in that area are, are very socially isolated. And areas like Pomroy come eighth in, in the index of over 500 areas in terms of lack of services. So can the Minister give a commitment that she will try to roll back on some of the budget cuts around rural transport because it, it really does create massive issues in terms of access to services? I, I could assure the member that I do absolutely recognise the importance of community transport um, in reaching out and connecting some of our most vulnerable citizens, but also allowing them to access services and tackle the social isolation uh, that you spoke about. Um, the reality, though, is that I have inherited very severe budgetary constraints within which I have to operate, so I absolutely recognise the importance of it. What I'm actually doing in these first initial weeks is assessing the priorities within my budget in terms of commitments, flagship project commitments, commitments within the new decade, new approach, and obviously within my priorities as well. But I do want to assure the member that for me it is a, a very, very important service, and I think the answer lies in the collaborative work and across a number of government departments and with councils. I call Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her questions or her answers thus far. Could she maybe elaborate? Um, I'm glad she has mentioned uh, the dependency that many of our rural constituents have on these uh, community transport services. Could maybe ask for her assessment of the provision currently on offer for rural constituents, and also uh, maybe a wee bit more elaborate on the conversation she's had with ministerial colleagues as to how we can address the issue. Yes, um, uh, I, I think that they provide a vital service. I think that they have been operating under constraints because we have seen uh, budget restrictions imposed as a result uh, of budget cuts to my department. Um, in terms of the uh, rural assisted transport scheme, um, that is funded by the um, Department of Environment and Rural Affairs. I administer it. Um, I think that there is scope. I want to continue to do that, but I think that there's a conversation to be had with a number of executive colleagues. Uh, I'm thinking of health, because we've just said about a quarter of the trips are for health appointments, so I want to have a creative and collaborative conversation uh, with the Minister for Health uh, as well. Uh, the truth is, all of our budgets uh, are facing challenges. We need to be smarter in how we're delivering services, uh, and for me, it is about going in, particularly those communities that aren't able to access public transport, that aren't able to access the other modes of transport that many of us do have access to. I call Rosemary Barton. Minister, I also welcome you to your position. Would the Minister acknowledge that delays in approving departmental budgets means that coordinating staff and those staff who are critical to providing such a high level of service will have had employment notices, and some may even be seeking more secure employment. When will the community transport organisations be notified of their 2020-21 budget to end such uncertainty? Yes, I firmly believe that um, with single-year budgets, it just creates a lot of pressure right across the system. It doesn't allow us to properly plan. It doesn't give certainty to people who are put on protective notice, uh, people who are doing vitally important uh, work. I welcome the commitment in the new decade, new approach to a move to a multi-year budget. I think that that will very much uh, help and assist the situation. Um, but in terms of the situation facing me, I don't know as yet the, the budget that I will have for the incoming year. When I do it, what I do want to do is to use that to um, give as much certainty to people as possible, but also to use that money to make sure that we're using it in a transformative way. Nicole Kelly Armstrong. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, and I will declare an interest, having worked in community transport for 16 years before coming to this House in 2016. But to ask the Minister, um, I'm, I'm very grateful for the words that she has said. Um, I didn't work for so many years lobbying the committee to, to try and get those words in for the department. But what I would like to ask is, when you mention about sustainable, one of the things that's happened with community transport that many in this House know about is the ongoing threat to their existence because of the lack of clarity on their operating licences. And I ask the Minister, will she either commit to um, sorting out the issue of the Section 10B permit or replicate the GB system by bringing in the Section 19 or the Section 22 community bus services? Because without that clarification, community transport is dying on the vine. Thank you. Yes, uh, you know, I understand that there are issues around the 10B permit uh, that continue to generate both interest and concern among stakeholders, and I've had a number of correspondence already from members and others um, on that issue. The High Court in London provided an important judgment in December 2019, I'm sure the member is well aware of this, around what activities can be defined as non-commercial. Now, the ruling did not provide a definition of non-commercial, but it has outlined a set of principles, and my officials are continuing to work through that to determine the implications for Northern Ireland of that recent High Court judgment, with the feuds developing guidance on the matter. And I do realise the impact that it's having, and I would like to be able to see us moving to a position where we can get clarity around the guidance, and hopefully in a very helpful way, um, in a timely manner. Moving on, I call Matthew O'Toole. Uh, question number three, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, again, I thank the member um, for his question. He is. Uh, tackling the climate emergency is the single biggest global challenge we face. As Infrastructure Minister, I am focused on delivering clean public transport and active travel options to build connectivity, reduce emissions and promote health and wellbeing for all. Poor air quality poses a major risk to public health. Long-term exposure to air pollution can cause chronic conditions such as cardiovascular and respiratory diseases, affecting the quality of our, of our lives and life expectancy. Given the impact of transport on greenhouse gas emissions and air quality, reducing congestion and decarbonising public transport must be a priority. However, we need to achieve this at a time when our public finances are constrained. So it is vital that we work in partnership harnessing the collective resources of our public and private sector and civil society to deliver innovative solutions that benefit everyone. I hope that executive colleagues and assembly members recognise the important role of my department in improving lives um, and in tackling uh, health inequalities and also protecting our environment. I look forward to us all working together, recognising that investment in infrastructure is not an end in itself. It is about people and place. It is about unlocking our economic potential, protecting our valuable environment to transform and connect lives. And it is about improving health and wellbeing for all our communities across Northern Ireland. I can assure the member, while this is a huge task, I am ambitious, and collectively we cannot just be ambitious, but we can deliver lasting change for our communities now and for years to come. I call Matthew O'Toole for supplementary. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and uh, I welcome the Minister, obviously, to her uh, post. And also, I'd like to congratulate the Minister on showing an example by being the first Minister to get on her bike and get on high vis, as she did last week, which is very welcome and an example to us all. Um, so with that in mind, can I just ask the Minister to set out um, further plans for future investment in cycling, walking and also uh, the railways? I, I thank the member um, for his question. Um, yes, I am excited to be in the e-car as well as I, I jumped on the e-bike as well. Uh, and I would recommend it to everybody, the e-bike. It's, it's actually a really good experience. Um, the member is aware that I have set out an ambitious vision for a low carbon future and one of my key challenges is to increase sustainable travel options for people including rail, walking and cycling. If more people choose to turn to greener transport options, this will not only help address climate change, it will make a positive contribution to general health and well-being. Over the coming weeks, I want to carefully consider how best to deliver on my active and sustainable travel ambitions. Uh, and once the budget process provides clarity on the resources available, I will be able to firm up my objectives and I look forward to discussing and debating them on the floor of this House. I call Michelle McElveen. 
be aware that only 427 battery electric vehicles were purchased in Northern Ireland last year, and with only 337 charging points, it's hardly a surprise. In Ards and North Down Council, there are only eight charging points, with only three of those being in the in the Ards area, um, which really, as a as a, a tourist destination, really isn't enough. Um, if we're serious about lowering emissions, we need to get the basic infrastructure in place. Can the Minister tell the House what funding stream she is actively pursuing to assist councils in improving the current situation? I absolutely uh, agree with the member, and I'm actually finding this out uh, at a very cold front face, uh, having an e-car, the limited amount of infrastructure that there is. And if we are serious about encouraging people to look, use low emission or zero uh, carbon emission vehicles, then we have to absolutely address the infrastructure. She's right, the 337 charging points are just not enough. Um, the utility regulator is in the process uh, of looking at a report which should be helpful in terms of trying to open up the network, and I'll be taking guidance from that. I'm also aware that the Department for Transport very recently announced that it will be doubling the funding available for on-street charging, which is really helpful for those people who don't have access to a garage or a driveway. Um, while we can't draw that funding down directly, what I have asked officials to do is to work with others to support applications, and we will continue to work with the Office for Low Emission Vehicles to see if we can maximise the opportunities around that. I have also had a conversation with the Minister for um, Environment and Rural Affairs, uh, Minister Poots, and he is keen to work uh, with me as I am with him because we both recognise that it is an important step forward in terms of at least tackling the climate emergency. I call Philip McGuigan. Last can, call you. Uh, can I also uh, congratulate the Minister on her appointment and welcome her views and, and comments on cycling and active travel. And I look forward to working with her on the many issues that I have regarding those topics. Today uh, is just about noting the, the comments that the Minister made at the recent announcement of TransLink that they are intending to use renewably sourced hydrogen fuel sourced from uh, one farm in North Antrim, my own constituency, uh, to power buses built by Wright Bus yeah. in my own constituency. Uh, so, given, given that, can I ask the Minister if uh, her department has any plans to follow that lead by uh, decarbonising ferries, and particularly the Rathlin Ferry in my own constituency, to use hydrogen power? Uh, Yes, I, I was at the launch uh, of the three hydrogen buses uh, at TransLink. Um, there were a number of the committee members there, and it's really exciting. Um, it's the first in Ireland, and once again, Northern Ireland is leading the way. Um, it's something that I would like to see us do more of. It's just amazing that you have buses that their only emission is water. Uh, we need to get more of that, and I'm delighted that they could be on the road later um, this year. In terms of the hydrogen ferry in Rathlin, it's something that is not currently being considered, but I am very aware of the great efforts that are going on by the community there to make Rathlin a, a zero carbon a economy, and I want to be able to play my part in that. I look forward to chairing um, the ministerial forum, and I actually really look forward to getting to Rathlin myself to meet with people and to hear about their exciting plans, be it for a wind turbine or for the ferry or so forth. So I, I really am looking forward to learning more and doing what I can to assist them. Moving on, can I call Colm Gilton -Yu? Last ever a kahar let hall question number four please. Okay, thank the member uh, for his for his question. Um, the current situation is not acceptable, and I have instructed the DVA uh, to work urgently to get a safe, sustainable, and trusted service up and running as soon and as safely as possible. Testing on heavy goods vehicles and buses is continuing. Heavy duty lanes are also being used and MOT opening hours are being extended to prioritise taxis and four-year-old customers for both private customers and dealerships. All other customers except taxis and those with four-year-old cars are being automatically issued an MOT exemption certificate which they can use to tax their vehicle and thereby continue to drive. Two new lifts have been installed to provide additional capacity and three existing lifts have also been independently inspected and cleared for use. I am determined that all options will be explored to minimise the disruption to customers, but the safety of staff and customers will continue to be my top priority. In terms of the MOT test, the roadworthiness test is part of a wider regime designed to ensure that vehicles are kept in a safe and environmentally acceptable condition during their use. 
In Northern Ireland, we have no powers to omit the underbody inspection of the vehicle test, um, which is what is happening uh, in the South. But I do have powers under the road traffic order to issue temporary exemption certificates for the whole test, which I moved quickly to do. Uh, this also allows drivers to tax their vehicle and stay on the road. I believe my approach to issuing certificates of temporary exemption is a measured approach that minimises disruption to customers, provides capacity to test priority vehicles and allows the space to put in place sustainable measures to restore a full, safe vehicle testing service, which I am committed to doing, but I must ensure the health and safety of staff and road users. I call Colin Gilden you for supplementary. Gormay Hoggart, Minister. Uh, does the Minister acknowledge that parity with the South's testing system for cars would greatly alleviate the pressure and backlog currently facing MOT centres and potentially save the Department from some of the spending envisaged for a new network of test centres? In terms of parity with the South, if we're talking about uh, the partial MOT testing, it's not possible. It was one of the options that I did explore. It just wasn't possible given the legislation here. Uh, and I wouldn't have been able to extend the temporary exemption certificates, which then wouldn't have allowed people to be able to tax their vehicle and keep it on the road. So I do believe that the issuing of the temporary exemption certificates was the right one for us. Uh, the member will be aware, though, that in considering all of the options, one of the options that I am considering is a move from testing four-year-old to ten-year-old cars uh, once a year to every two years. Uh, that is one of a number of options that I am considering because I want to be able to explore every single option uh, to try to resolve this situation and get us to a better place. I call Gordon Dunn. Mr Speaker, and I welcome the Minister to her post and I look forward to her visiting North Down to see the, the numerous problems we have in relation to infrastructure. Uh, would the Minister agree that it is difficult to understand that all vehicle lifts and test centres have become unserviceable at present, and does this reflect poor management? And I would uh, appreciate clarification on what the measures that she has proposed in relation to the testing of four-year-old cars, <coughs> excuse me, cars, <coughs> taxis and trade vehicles. I think that's two questions. Minister may, <laughs> the Minister may choose to answer one or other. Okay. Uh, in terms of the four-year-old vehicles, it is just not possible uh, to issue them with a temporary exemption certificate. I am frustrated, uh, I'm sure, as the member is about that. So the measures that I've put in place is to prioritise the MOT testing of four-year-old vehicles uh, with individual customers, but also car dealerships. Um, we have utilised the heavy duty lane uh, for the priority vehicles. We're looking at extended opening on Sundays, again, to prioritise the four-year-old vehicles. So trying to do uh, what we can um, within that. Uh, in terms of the other question, yes, um, I am concerned that we got to a point where cracks were noticed for the first time in November past, and we have escalated so quickly uh, to the situation we now find ourselves in. That is why, as part of the measures that I have put in place to address the situation, uh, include two reviews. One review is uh, independent of my department by auditors, because I, uh, I want to understand what happened here. I want to understand who knew what when and what action was taken, and a key part of that will be the contract that was involved in terms of the inspections. Uh, the second is uh, the, by the appointment of uh, independent engineers, uh, and I have asked them to provide me with um, independent expert advice about the steps that I need to put in place to get our MOT centres fully and safely operable uh, as quickly as possible. And that is the end of our time for listed questions, and we now move on to topical questions. And uh, can I advise members that uh, topical question number three has been withdrawn? I call Christopher Stulford. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister what assessment her department has made of the success or otherwise of the residents only parking scheme in the Holy Land area? Um, uh the member raises a very uh, important issue. Uh, the residence parking scheme, the very first one, as I understand it, was in the Rugby Road area of Belfast. That is currently being evaluated and assessed. And I know that there are a number of requests in for residence parking schemes uh, in a number of places. 
What I want to do is I want to get the assessment of the Rugby Road one. I want to understand what works uh, and what doesn't so that we are applying best practice and learning as we try to roll the schemes out into other areas, if that is what communities wish. I call Christopher Stolford for supplement. Thank the Minister for that reply, and I was remiss to not welcome her to her place. Um, I think the, uh, there would be no doubt that the residents of Rugby Road think that the scheme has worked. Uh, the Minister represents a city constituency like myself and is aware that in communities like Sandy Row, the market, Donegal Pass, uh, there is a real desire for this. Can I ask the Minister to ensure that this assessment of the success of the Rugby Road scheme is carried out as expeditiously as possible so that we can get this rolling for people living in inner cities and communities in Belfast? Yes, I'm very mindful that you know, the fact that we haven't had an assembly or executive for three years means that we are behind on a number of things. Um, I want to be able to expeditiously look at things, uh, but I will also look to the member and other members uh, to help me engage with local communities because these schemes can only work and will only work if they are done with the consent uh, of the community. So I look forward, no doubt, to getting uh, letters from the member uh, inviting me out. Yes, <laughs> inviting me out to meet uh, to meet with. Um, Residents and to discuss that very issue, and I am very happy to do so. I call Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Minister uh, Storm Kira uh, brought rain, high winds, and flooding, localised flooding, um, over the weekend. And today we have snow. Recognising the great work that has taken place by her department over the weekend, can the minister outline what contingencies that she may have put in place now uh, for the yellow warning uh, over the next few days? I can thank the member. Um, the worst of the heavy rainfall associated with this storm fell uh, across the west. Critical information in relation to potential impacts as a result of this rainfall was shared with key partner organisations to raise awareness, and my department played a key role in establishing the effective multi-agency emergency response to this storm. My department also placed staff on standby, opened control centres and maintained a presence at key known vulnerable locations considered to be at risk to enable a prompt emergency response that ultimately involved the deployment of over 2,000 sandbags. The effort put in by staff was huge and I want to put on record my thanks and appreciation to them because they have worked tirelessly to keep us all safe. This week, weather warnings have been issued by the Met Office for wind and snow to the middle of the week, with a few centimetres of snow over ground uh, above or around 150 uh, metres. Any snow accumulations over lower ground are likely to be temporary. However, icy surfaces will be an additional hazard. I call Thank you, Minister, uh, for that response, and I'm sure all constituents uh, will feel a great deal of comfort uh, at the level of preparedness uh, from your department. In my own constituency of Foil, um, there have been some very uh, localised flooding, and, and really one of the reasons for that was the block gullies. Um, can I um, ask the Minister to commit to looking in to um, unblocking those gullies in, in the, the Derry City area, please? Um, I am advised that culvert inlet grills were cleared and gullies maintained as part of my department's proactive and preparatory work ahead of Storm Kira, and that it did indeed reduce the risk of flooding in many locations across Northern Ireland. However, I recognise the concerns the member is raising uh, in terms of her own constituency, and I will ask officials to get in touch uh, with you to assess the situation. I call Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And can I also wish the Minister well going forward in her new role? And I want to bring it back to all politics is local and you and I are both North Belfast MLAs. Um, can I ask you for an update on the, the glider and has a route been um, decided upon yet? And if not, when will that be? Um, uh, yes, the glider service was launched in September uh, 2018, and uh, the gliders produce 30% less emissions than the buses that they replaced. Um, and it is proven to be extremely popular with 45,000 additional passenger journeys. And I want to build on this success. The North South uh, Belfast Glider Route is one of the projects identified for inclusion in the Belfast Region City Deal. The next stages will require close working across all departments and with the other Belfast Region City Deal partners to try and find agreement on funding on which projects are most capable of being delivered. But to that end, my officials are also working closely with the councils and with other partners 
to take forward a feasibility and options appraisal, which will help in identifying route options. And this work should be completed by the end of the year. Um, in terms of North Belfast, there is no decision yet as on the route, and I understand that we will have have different views across the constituency, but what I'm keen to do is to learn from the glider experience uh, in phase one. And so I think it's very important that when we have the feasibility and the options around preferred routes, that I do take time out to consult with people across North Belfast to make sure that we're making the best decision that can benefit the maximum amount of people in North Belfast. I call Paula Bradley. Uh, can I thank the Minister for her answer? And can I just then ask our mentioned to the Minister and asked the Minister if the route does decide that it's going along the Antrim Road and not the Shore Road, will the Minister undertake to look at an extra train halt, at least one extra train halt? We have two train stations in North Belfast, in White Abbey and in York Road, and both of which are their park and rider packed to capacity. So there certainly is value and merit in looking seriously at at least one extra train halt. I can certainly see the merits in the case for an additional uh, train halt. North Belfast is one of the places that is very much disconnected, and I think we could be doing so much more to connect it in terms of public transport, not least uh, on the issue of rail, as well as a halt. And I've been in members with the, or meetings with the members in North Belfast, so I know our passion for the place. I share it. You know, there's a case to be made around the York Street uh, station uh, as well. There's a lot of work to be done there. And we gain, there's a case to be made for transport-led regeneration uh, in areas like North Belfast, South Belfast, and a whole range of constituencies. Uh, so it's something that I want to consider. Um, but I have to be realistic as well. I've inherited uh, you know, a severely frustrating budget. There are many things that I would really like to do that I think are worth doing, that we should be investing in. But I have to always assess the priorities. There are flags flagship executive projects that I'm committed to, there are commitments within the new decade, new approach, and then my priorities on top of that. But I do want to assure the member that maximising public transport, getting people out of cars, you know, on foot, on their uh, bikes, using public transport, be it bus or rail, is really important to me. So I want to do as much as I can within those constraints. I call Philip McGuigan. Minister, uh, while Swift had a fairly uh, mild winter so far. I mean, there's really been a uh, discussion about Storm Kira and possible snow uh, later on this week. Can I ask you if you have any plans within your department? Order, order. Could I ask members who wish to have a conversation to please do so outside of the chamber? I'm trying to listen to the, to the questioner, as I'm sure other members are. Please continue. Uh, I was just asking the Minister if she had any plans to do a review of the winter getting schedule, in particular uh, trying to ensure that the routes to all our rural schools are covered. Uh, winter grading service is critically important, and again, I, I want to pay tribute to the staff who are involved in that uh, and working through the night to keep us all safe. The winter service budget is another area. It's going to sound like a broken record here, but it's because I'm being honest, it is under severe pressure. We're actually reliant on in year monitoring bids, and that is not sustainable going forward. I think if I'm quoting correctly from the figures, um, 28% of our road network is gridded, which covers about 80% of the traffic route. Yes, I would like to do more, particularly around rural schools, but again, it comes back to that issue of budget. If we were to increase the network that we were gridding, we could see a doubling of the budget that's required to do that. So we would like to do more. It's going to probably be a mantra, but there are budget constraints, but certainly we can look at things on an individual basis as well. I, I know some members had mentioned to me before about even funerals in rural areas, and there is written work on the council. There is stuff that we can do there. So it is an area that I'm aware of. I do recognise the importance of it, and again, want to do as much as I can, but operating within a very, very restricted budget. I call Philip McGuigan for supplementary. Uh, and I understand the minister may not have the information at hand. I mean, you did say that uh, to achieve. Uh, Greater uh, wonder Gretton, it would double your budget. How much is that in actual monetary terms? Um, I don't know if I have the figures here, uh, but I can follow them up in writing. But my understanding is that the current budget that we that is used, I think it's maybe five to seven. Uh, million would be used to grit the 28 per cent of that road network, which covers 80 per cent of the traffic. If I were to move to, say, 100 per cent, you're talking about £10 million. That's the figures that I have. But what I will do is I will double-check uh, and I will follow it up in writing with the member. I call Mr Melissa McHugh. 
I'd just like at the outset to congratulate you on your new post and to thank you for your statement this morning uh, in relation to the development of the Great North Road in Straban. It's very, very important to us and many of us who have lo lobbied in fact, for that same improvement. But I'd like to ask the Minister as well that, uh, if she can give us an update on the footbridge from the Straban depot to the centre of Straban town. Um, I want to thank the member uh, for his very kind words. Thank you. I very much appreciate them. Um, I, I understand his interest in this. A number of members um, in West Tyrone have written to me on the issue of the footbridge. I can confirm that my officials are actively uh, engaging with Derry City and Strabane District Council to further develop the concept and design for the footbridge. Uh, as I said, I know this is uh, a matter uh, that is very important to a number of MLAs and uh, to the people uh, of Strabane, uh, and I want to do what I can to progress it, but it has to be part of the city deal package. And so at this moment in time, until the heads of terms for the city deal have been finalised, it's not possible for me to give any more definitive uh, information on it at this stage. I call Mr Melissa McHugh for supplementary. Um, uh, I would just ask if the Minister would appreciate just uh, how important this footbridge is to the centre of Stabane town. It crosses the Moran River uh, and currently it's quite a, a walking distance uh, from the main shopping centre to the bus depot. And it will be very, very significant in the development of this bridge, not only uh, to the traders in that in Stabane town, but those people who would come to Stabane town by bus. Uh, it encourages them to use public transport, in fact, then, so they are able to easily access the shopping centres at the same time. Uh, and I do recognise the merits of this project, and it does sit, you know, sits very well with the priorities that I have about connecting people, uh, about encouraging people to be active uh, and to sustainably transport. So, uh, for all of those reasons, you know, I can see the merit of it. Um, I need to work within the city deal funding, so I do want to do what I can. Um, and I look forward to actually being down in Straban to actually see some of the designs for myself, uh, to meet with a member and to meet with, with others to hear the importance of the project as well. I now call Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Does the Minister realise that a lot of people out there in the streets are left in the dark? And can the Minister advise on what plans there are in place to restore uh, street lighting. Within my own constituency of North Down, there is over 1,000 street lights, which have been out now for a number of months. Uh, and this is due, we are told, to the non-availability of an external contractor, which I'm sure the minister would agree is unacceptable. The member uh, touches on a very, very important uh, issue. Um, the reality is that it takes £3.5 million per annum to carry out a full street lighting repair system. The current budget allocated was one million. We have 12,000 street lights that are out right across Northern Ireland. Before the severe budgetary situation was imposed in the department, there was an internal team and there was external contractors. The reality is the external contractors have been had to let go. So the, the truth is that we're operating with a team of five full-time and three part-time workers servicing all of the streetlights across Northern Ireland. You know? So it actually is a, is a situation of, I think, grave importance. I very much believe that if we are to demonstrate to people that having an assembly and an executive makes a big difference in their lives, then one of the ways of doing that is quickly addressing the streetlighting issue, fixing the potholes in the road. They may not be the most transformative projects in the world, but they are really important to people. I have a bilateral with Minister Murphy tomorrow. I'll be making these points to him because I actually think it's not in just my interest as a minister responsible. I think it's in the interest of the executive to be doing much more to switch our lights back on. And that is the end of our time for questions to the minister. Could I ask members to take their ease for a few moments?